were just living, the, you know, what we called American dream. You know, we weren't, we weren't rich money wise, but we were rich in in love and family togetherness, and and it was just great. There's just no way I could have ever imagined being in this situation. I do not want to go to an execution. I never in my life thought I would even have to be in a situation to even think of that. Wilson Light. Wilson Light will make my day. Welcome to Texas. Life is great. It was just after 2 o'clock this afternoon. A customer walked into the Golden Nugget Pawn Shop here in the 9800 block of Airline and found two people shot. I could tell one person was dead, and the other person had a lot of blood on his face, and I could tell he had been shot. 25 year old Mark Kelly is the son of the pawn shop owner. He was rushed to Herman Hospital. His 20-year-old sister was pronounced dead here at the scene. A terrible tragedy for Jim Kelly and his wife. This can't be happening to us. Uh, <laughs> Jack Cato, Channel 2 News, Nightcast. Looking back and thinking when I was younger, as to what my life would be at this point, there's just no way I could have ever imagined being in this situation. First, having your children die before you. Second, the fact that they were murdered, not even with illness, but murdered. And then having to consider watching an execution. I thought I would be buying Christmas gifts for all my kids and my grandkids and having big get-togethers, having a happy Christmas. Across America, relatives of murder victims are demanding the right to see the killer executed. The state of Texas has now granted this right, and in just over a week, Linda Kelly will become the first person to view the execution of her children's murderer. I got these articles and this information in the mail today from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Victim Services. And one of the things I was looking at here was executing the murderer of the victim's family speak out. If someone you loved were murdered, would you want to see the killer executed? So I don't know if I needed to read these or not because it might start making me confused and change my mind. Because I know I'm going to be there and I know I'm going to watch it. Here's a booklet that tells you the type of clothing to wear, of course. It says, close relatives of the victim who will witness execution should dress conservatively. No tank tops, no cutoffs or shorts, and no see-through fabrics. And I guess there are people that would dress maybe like this, but we're not a particular family that would do that. But now it's getting real excited. My nerves are getting on edge because it's coming up. It's a week from tomorrow, so whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, I hope I'm prepared for how I'm going to feel when I come out of there. It's a horrible thing when you have two people in your family who've been killed and you go through all these emotions and stuff like that. I mean, mom's gone through all of it, pretty much all of it. And it's very difficult when you're grieving to keep your life together, keep it in order. With mom and dad there, and I was living with mom and dad, it was just hard. I mean, I couldn't cry in front of them because then they would go to pieces. And I never, I don't think I ever have cried in front of them. But it's a different, you have a different grief that you go through, and then you have that guilt that you're the only one left, and why are you the only one left? And well, with Mark and Kara too, they were my only friends before they were killed. Hi, glad to see you. See I you. think this is finally going to start working out. All these times I've been wanting this marker moved. Good, good. So after Mark and Kara were buried, I just kept thinking, how could this happen? 
You know, Mark and Kara can't be gone. I mean, you have your children, you raise them, and you do the regular things that regular people do. You don't bury your children. When the, the markers were down, I sit there on the ground and run my fingers over their name. It was like, these were my babies. I remember picking these names out. This is not right that I have to look at my children's names on a grave marker. And that'll be wonderful. And then I can put the flowers where they're supposed to be. Right. That's wonderful. Gosh, thanks a lot. You bet. I tell you I what, you, you. I, you've helped me a lot out here when I come out. <laughs> thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Kara was my youngest. She was like six and a half years younger than Mark. Her name was sort of unusual at the time. You didn't hear that many girls with the name Kara, K-A-R-A. And so she was real proud of her name. She was a real original, real original person. And good-hearted. Kara, oh, Kara had such a good heart. I've never seen anyone that could talk to animals like Kara could. She could walk into a stall with a stammering horse, and she'd go, Mom, it's okay. And she would walk up to that horse, and that horse, I saw it with my own eyes or I would never have believed it. That horse would just calm down, totally calm down. I know it sounds strange, but Kara was just me. The love we had for each other was just... She would come in the back door and she would drop her purse and her keys on the table and say, Hey, Mom, where are you? And I, I remember that. It's so vividly. It's, uh, I mean, for, for a long time, it's like I just kept expecting to hear that purse and keys drop on my table. And, and hey, Mom. Now that the execution has come up, it's a week from today, we really have to look at the devilish situation for what it is. So my first reaction was, I'm not going to watch somebody die. That's... That's just as evil as, as killing some, you know, I mean, what kind of mentality is it that you want to watch somebody die? I'm not that heinous, you know. I mean, Jenkins, Jenkins killed Mark and Kara, and he could view that, and he could watch it, but I didn't. I, we're too humane. We're too... Mom and Dad and I are, are too human and sensitive, and I was real surprised that Mom wants to see it. But now my view has changed, and I, I think I, I, well, I will be there in the room, and I think I want to see it, unless at the very end I decide that it's not what I want. Mark was very active, a typical boy, boundless energy extremely talented in sports. In fact, he played sports from the time he was seven. He played peewee football, peewee baseball, and he was always on the all-star team and was like the first draft in the little leagues and was a really good tennis player. And he actually got a scholarship to a college in Galveston. He was a real, a real good boy. I was blessed with having him and the girls. It was just like all this wonderful, happy family, this great life we were having. Then when my children became adults, I would look at him and I thought, gosh, I really, then I patted myself on the back. I said, yeah, I did a good job because they all turned out to be such good, caring, decent, decent people. Everything that we worked for all our lives was becoming fulfilled. until it all ended. We had a massive overcrowding problem in the Texas penitentiary that was essentially forcing inmates out in droves. So in six years you had a 347 percent increase of convicted felons released back to the community and it it just wrecked havoc amongst the uh, the law-abiding public. Leo Ernest Jenkins was on a nine-year sentence for a burglary of a building, had been denied parole numerous times. He was released due to the early release program and obviously it doesn't take a mental genius to figure out if he had done his nine-year sentence that Linda Kelly 
Jim Kelly and whole, whole Kelly family would not be in this position that they are today. The pawn shop that Mark and Kara were killed in was our main business. We had had it for several years before we put Mark in there as the manager. And Kara did the book work. Leo Jenkins had been to a pawn shop on airline and he and his cohort had discussed robbing that place. And they discussed that they wanted no witnesses, so they made up their minds before they left the apartment that uh, they were going to kill whoever was working there at the pawn shop. According to his statement, Leo said he went in once, and I believe somebody was there, and they went outside and did some dope. We got some ammo for his gun. He loaded the clip. It wasn't like that he was going to rob nobody, you know what I'm saying? Because we stopped by the store, we got a few beers, we got high, we did a few things, and we walked on down to the pawn shop. Well, Kara called me. And she was all excited because her first anniversary was coming up. And she said, I, I think I want to try to have a baby. And I was so excited. I said, oh, Kara, I said, I can make all your maternity clothes. I said, oh, they've got some neat colors that'll look good with your red hair. And I mean, we were just having a mother-daughter conversation. The other line came in and she put me on hold. They shot the female first and the male was sitting at a desk and he tried to get up and they shot and killed him. It was like, pow, you know, she fell, you know, like pow, 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 you know, then Mark fell. And when Mark was on the floor, he shot Mark again, you know, going like, oh, man, you know. It was like something that you watch on a, on a television show, you know, like an old Humphrey Bogart movie or something. And then the next call I got was my brother-in-law called me and said, I have some really bad news. And then he just blurted it out. He said, Kara's dead and Mark's been shot in the head. And I went, what are you talking about? I just had Kara on the phone. I was just talking to Kara. And he said, there was a robbery at the shop. And he said, Kara's dead. And, and they shot Mark. So I just hung the phone up. I didn't know what to do. I mean, this is not something real people have to deal with. So I drove to the shop and jumped out of the car, and my husband had already gotten there, and he had his shirt off. They said he just grabbed his shirt, and he just ripped his shirt off himself. And then I ran towards the building, and this detective was standing there, and I said, where is, where is Kara? Where is my Kara? And he just shook his head and he said, I'm sorry, Miss Kelly. I'm sorry. I remember turning around. And then when I turned back, they were bringing Kara out, covered up. When we got to the emergency entrance to the hospital, they took us to this little room. I said, where is Mark? I understand he has a bullet in his head. I said, you know, is he in surgery? And they said, well, no, Miss Kelly, there, he's not. And I said, well, I don't understand. Mark is very healthy and very strong person. If you just get that bullet out of his head, I, he'll be okay. And they just, there again, they just kept saying, no, Miss Kelly, Mark's not gonna make it. Finally, when I kept saying, why aren't, you know, why aren't you saving him? Why do you not have him in surgery? And they said, Miss Kelly, they just blew his brains out. It was one of those cases that uh, the death penalty statute was made for. Jenkins showed absolutely no remorse. It was a cold killing. Uh, two people, strangers, were killed, and he wiped them away just like they didn't exist. We saw nothing of a mitigating factor, uh, nothing to show us that if given an opportunity that Jenkins wouldn't do this again. During the trial, they sit you pretty close to each other. Every now and then I would talk to his lawyers and 
he'd get in the conversation and he had a nickname everybody called him red uh, and i think that came from the fact that he was his hair was kind of red he had a red tint to it so at times you wouldn't call him jenkins you'd refer to him as red likable individual but uh, he just again that antisocial personality he's potentially dangerous and uh, he's like a stick of dynamite you never know when it's going to explode I think probably the thing that sticks out most in my mind is when we called uh, Jim Kelly, the father of the two kids, to testify. Mr. Kelly had, had, you know, had communicated to us an extreme dislike for the defendant. The, he had three kids, and the defendant had killed two of them, and more or less ruined his life. And so when we called him, it, uh, there was a lot of static electricity in the air. and. When he came in, he came in at a slow pace, and he watched the defendant all the way till he got to the witness stand. He put his briefcase on the table and opened it real slow, at whole time staring at, at Jenkins. And uh, we were a little concerned about what was in that briefcase. He was asked a question that didn't seem like it called for him having to go to the attache case to, to, to look for any, any records or anything like that. I was thinking that he was probably had a gun inside and he was going to try to shoot Leo. I kind of moved away from Red, and I think his defendants, his attorneys kind of moved away from him too. I kind of moved towards the jury some. I had a, a chair that would slide and Mr. Vincent did the same thing. I noticed the defense attorneys kind of moved away from him too. So everybody was studying this man to see what he was going to bring out of that briefcase. And when he did finally bring a slip of paper out, I think everybody sighed, including the jury. The first time I saw Ernest Leo Jenkins, I felt the evilness in him. He stared at me with those eyes. I've never seen anyone with eyes like that. There was just nothing there. To me, he was an animal. It was like he had, it didn't matter what where he came from. I don't care what his background is. I don't care what happened to him in his childhood. Nothing should drive a human being to commit a crime like that. I've never met him, I've never seen him. Mom and Dad have. And they've described how cold he is and how his look, he doesn't have, he has no soul in his eyes. You have to, I guess, so, I, so I want to see it because he's not really human. <laughs> and so it's not as if we're watching somebody else die who really has feelings and is real human and is sensitive and and has experienced love and has experienced all those things that all of us human beings experience. So now I look at it like if you have friends and, you, and they go hunting out in the wilderness and one of them gets killed by a bear, of course you'd want to shoot that bear and kill that bear. And, and you wouldn't probably, if you were out there hunting with them, you wouldn't even mind shooting him yourself just to make sure he's dead. That's how it feels for me now. This guy Jenkins is not human. I mean, he is a human being, but he, do he doesn't have anything that a human being, normal human being has, emotional-wise. So it's like shooting a bear. It's like watching a bear die in hell. I'll, I'll watch that. You're not even an animal. You know, I have cats that kill animals. They kill an animal, they eat it. You're worse than that. You're worse than anything I've ever seen in my life. Randy Ertman addresses the killer of his teenage daughter. This confrontation in a Texas courtroom was unprecedented. It marked the beginning of the campaign by victims' relatives to witness the execution of the murderer. But you rot in hell. You can look at me if you want. Look at me! Look! Well, we had a capital murder trial that was going on in Houston in the fall of 1993. And Randy Ertman and I were in the hallway talking during the punishment phase, and Randy came up to me and, uh, in so many words, you know, he said, you know, I'd really like to be there to see this scum get executed. And he said, can I be there? I just, really, I just stopped and pondered. I, it's a good question. Real, no one's ever asked that before. I, I don't know. I'll find out for you. 
my name is Bob Carrero, and on July 20th, 1992, my little girl, Kanara, and her best friend, Kristen Wiley, were both stabbed to death in Kristen's home. My little girl was stabbed 23 times, and Kristen was stabbed 18 times. Their eyes were gouged out. I'm Paul, and this is Carol Kavranovic. Our 16-year-old son, Stephen, was murdered March 16th of 1991 by two men, one of which... Uh, they were both arrested, one of which we got to trial. He was, uh, my son was set up to be robbed, and they knew that they were going to have to kill him when they set him up. I don't love to talk because whenever I talk, I feel more pain, what I am hurting. Most people that I know in parents of murdered children would witness an execution if they were given the opportunity. Because the people that come to parents and murder children are people that love their family members. When you have that kind of love for the person that was murdered, then you have that kind of anger for the person that did it. But what actually killed her was the hood ornament poked a hole in the back of her head. And the highway was covered with blood. And that highway still appears in my nightmares every now and then. The book of Revelations tells us about a lake of fire for those who do not repent of their sins. I think that's just about right. I joined Parents of Murdered Children probably about three months after my children were murdered. It was just overwhelming how people understood how we felt. And we didn't have to make excuses. And no one says, well, you know, it's been a year, it's been four years, it's been ten years. You should be over this. We all know that that's not the way it is. So after 15 and a half years, we went back to trial on a capital murder case on a man who said he did it and he would do it again and challenged the state to execute him and threaten the jurors. His name was the animal. He gave that to himself. I had the opportunity a couple of weeks back to go up and visit Mr. Mays on death row. I walked up to him in his cell. And uh, he was standing up against the bars of his cell, and, and I stood right in front of him. Looked into his eyes, and I said, how you doing, Mays? And he just looked right through me. There was nothing there, absolutely nothing as far as a human being. Uh, my feeling is they couldn't execute him soon enough, and I, and I really envy you, Linda. I hope, this, I hope this really goes through for you. And... Uh, I'd, I'd like to be the next one in line to be able to view by execution. Thank you for coming tonight. This coming Friday, I'm sure most of you know, um, Ernest Leo Jenkins, the man that murdered my two children, Mark and Kara, is due to be executed. I need to write a book, you know, what to wear in execution. I'm just not real sure. <laughs> have to go to Foley's. <laughs> yeah, execution etiquette, right? Go to Foley's. <laughs> Say, could you tell me what, what looks good for an execution? I take it lightly, but this is good because this is how we need to do. Okay, open the door. The Houston chapter of Parents Murder Children has day trips to death row anyone that's skeptical about watching an execution, if they go to the prison system and they tour it, then it eases their mind and they realize that it's not gruesome. It's very clinical. It's like walking into a hospital. This is the entrance to the death house. This is where inmate Jenkins will be brought through. He'll be brought over anywhere from four to eight hours prior to the scheduled execution. This area is what we call the death watch cells. When Jenkins arrives, he'll be under restraint. We'll remove the restraints, strip him down, search his body, search his clothes, put him in this first cell here. That one right there? This one right behind me. The chaplain is the key to this process. He's the one who actually prepares the inmate mentally, helps him get over this. We've not had any inmate resist or struggle with us, and we attribute that success primarily to the chaplain and to the officers who perform the duties of the death watch. Now, the warden and I will come back and we'll ask him some questions. Uh, what do you want to do with your property? Is anybody going to pick it up? What are you going to do with uh, the money in your trust fund account? Uh, 
What about your body? Is anybody going to claim your body? Who are your witnesses? Are they going to show up? At 6 o'clock... So this one will be a little it'll, after 6. It'll be a little after right. 6, yes ma'am. Jenkins will be a little after 6. Now what happens when he asks for his last meal? You, you just go everywhere you have to mm. to get what he wants? No. Or? Unlike you might see on TV or the movies, he can't have anything he wants. He can have anything we've got in our kitchen. Most of the big menu requests are for our steak and baked potato or cheeseburgers and fries. Some of them have a healthy appetite and just eat uh, enormous amounts of food. Uh, some eat like it's literally their last meal. It is, of course, but you know, you've always heard that old expression, he ate like it was his last meal. Any other questions? Do they feel anything? Do they hurt? Uh, is there any pain? No. Very humane to compare, Very to, compare to what is. they've done to our children uh, and the torture it, that they put our kids through. And I know. Yeah. I think sometimes it's too easy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it ought to be, a, uh, they ought to feel something if it's fire burning all the way through their body or whatever the case may be. I think there should be some little sense of pain to it, something, some awareness. You're being paid back for what you've done. I understand, and you're kind of preaching to the choir. I'd uh, yeah, no, <laughs> but you would think there would be yeah. something, some well, little bitty something our, of our, pain, just a little. At 6 o'clock, when we get the go-ahead from the governor's office, then we will get the inmate out of the cell and escort him in here to the death chamber. Now, if you want to come in, fine. If you don't feel like you can, well, well don't. Oh, it's a short walk. I thought it was a longer walk. I did, too. Yeah. Okay. You may have to kind of crowd up to make room for everyone. And this this isn't for everyone. Not everyone can, oh, can come in here. In. Uh, like I say, we'll, we'll escort him out of the cell in here. We won't reshackle him. We'll just surround him with five large young men. They'll escort him in. He'll hop up on the table. Those five men will then strap him down. They leave. At that point, the execution team comes in from this door. They will insert an IV into each arm that's strapped to these sideboards here. The tubing runs under the table through this little window to an IV stand where we have two bags of normal saline solution. We'll start a normal saline drip. Once we're sure we have a good flow of saline that the catheters are not clogged or anything, then we'll call for all the witnesses to be brought back. The condemned family will be escorted back into the room in there where David is. Uh, the victim's family will be brought into this other little room over here. The inmate will be given the opportunity to make his last statement. At that point, he says whatever he wants to say. We don't really care. After he gets through with his last statement, the signal is given for the first of the three chemicals to be administered. The first one is sodium thiopentothal. It's the same thing you would get in the hospital for major surgery. If you've had that, you know what happens. Within just a very few seconds, you're out. This guy goes into a deep sleep. We give him so much, we couldn't bring him back if we wanted to. Then we give him a massive dose of pancurium bromide. That is to paralyze the diaphragm. A little more saline, and then the last dose of potassium chloride, which is to stop the heart. We get all the chemicals in him. We wait a couple of minutes. The doctor comes in, checks the body, notes the time, makes the pronouncement of death. If he wanted to see us, he could lift his head to see us? Is there, sure, he can, or he he can, can look, look this way? Because <clears throat> he'll know we're going to be here, I'm sure. S some, I, I don't know. Because he, know, he knows the rules. He knows that it's, that, that it's possible. Uh, it's possible, yes. Right. I mean, like, he may not want to see us, but I said I had always wanted him to have to see Mark and Kara's picture before is the last thing he saw that this is what you did. This is why you're giving your life up because you murdered these two young people. And I wanted to bring their pictures and I wanted to find out if I could do that. If I just stand there with their pictures, if he looks up, he'll see Mark and Kara. Kind of can see them. In actuality, probably what would happen is he may glance down there and if he sees y'all, then he's not going to look. No, he's probably. not going to keep looking at us gutless, no. yeah. <laughs> if probably. he requests it, will those stripes be closed? No, ma'am. The only reason we close those drapes is if we have a blowout. If the catheter blows out of the vein. Has that ever happened? Uh, once. 
How you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Are there chairs for the family? No, ma'am. I'll take y'all into the witness area. Oh, it's going to go in comfort, isn't it, Sterling? It wouldn't bother me a bit. They could, they could do it to me. Are the uh, witness rooms Shoot, open? What a way to go, isn't it? Yeah, considering, well. considering Kara died in the middle of the floor at a pawn shop and Mark died with blood coming out of every hole in his head. I think he's going really nice. Wouldn't we all what like to go do? so easy? Going to oh, he's going to have to work Don't touch it. <laughs> this thing, this is it. I thought he was going to have to strain to see it. No, he, he can see. See, us. I thought he was going to have to strain. Okay, we're going to fight for position well, because I want to be right I don't here. Want to, you can have whatever position you want. He could see Mark and Kara's picture. I can see Mark and Kara. I can see Mark. Mark Kara's picture. Thirty-eight-year-old Ernest Leo Jenkins, who waived his rights to any further appeals, is scheduled to be put to death today for the 1988 murders of 20-year-old Denise Kelly Voss and 25-year-old Mark Kelly. Linda Kelly will be one of five family members to witness Hello. Jenkins' execution. Yeah, hi. Oh, it's getting close. It's, I know it's been on the news, Sterling, since you saw it on CNN a while ago. I said, isn't this something? This is the end. This is the closing chapter. And just anticipating what's going to happen and how we're going to feel and all that kind of stuff. There's so many different variables involved in this. So, we don't have enough time to think, we don't have enough time or energy to think about Jenkins. People magazine is not interested in our story because they can't watch the execution. It not that something... They want to see Jenkins executed, and if they can't actually see him executed, then they don't want anything to do with it. Two fifteen. We'll be up there before the execution. That's the thing. Even if we're a little late to the meeting, justice is for us today, Mother. Uh, yeah, I think we're on so. the, we're on as we've always been on the good side. Hey. Hi, Hi. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Sure us hard to get to this place. Hi, Wawa. Oh my God, we'll never get back on the freeway to for around and about. Dad, would you like a mint? Yeah, it's Look symbolic. at this traffic. We ought to call the Sheriff's Department and get an escort. I wonder if they charge us. Why don't we get you the light? We'll be all right. Yeah. Just get it's just that the... light. I cannot even believe this. Look at him getting that lane and the stupid fools. This is so typical. This us. lane didn't move. There this lane go. did not move. This is an emergency, people. Please, the lights change. I'm going to hold traffic up. This is ridiculous. But you be careful getting out there. Not Dad, can you go hold the traffic up? Uh, that, he's going to let you in. Okay. Yeah, but we have to get in the far left lane, well, Dad. When you get there, you have to, there's no way. <sighs> Robin just going to get herself killed. That's all we got left. Just to get out of here on the freeway in two seconds. No, I'm not English. Oh, we know speaking English. Oh, we know speaking English. That's probably what he's telling. No speaking English, lady. Where are you? 
Right here. Right here. And behind us. And tell him behind us. Amber. Go. And behind us. All right. Get in the van. Get in the van. Get in the van. Mom, you're fine. Go. Go. I tell you what, we raise a tough girl here. Shit. Well, damn, somebody's got to do something. Nobody was doing something. Oh, now we're missing. Oh, now we're missing. Oh. That's right, Wawa. This is, is it. Really Prison town. Wawa, Wawa, are you ready? Do you want to do it? What? Do you want to watch it? this? Sure, sure. That's what I come for. Yeah. I can close my That's eyes. Just... If it get too bad, I don't have exactly. to Exactly. You're right. Here we are. Here's the prison. Well, this is it. Oh, my Yep. Here's God. the administration building. What? Press out the Where? gazoopas. Oh, my God. Look out at the, the press. <gasps> at the front oh, door. Shit. Oh, oh Lord! The front door. This is where we. This is where we stop. Whoa! <sighs> um. This is really stressful for our family. This whole week has been really stressful for us. Um, of course, it's an experience no one wants to ever go through. I'm Angelin Kelly, and I'm 90 years old, and I feel like I need to be here. <laughs> I need to be here to see it's done. I forgive him, but I'll never forget the day. And thanks. When he got to the LS unit, Leo Jenkins was as far from God as any man could be. That's his own words. He says, the first time I went into that pawn shop, I said to myself, this will be an easy pushover. He said, I went in there with the intentions of robbing it. He says, I robbed it. I took the things that I wanted to take. He said, there was a little voice in me that kept saying, do it, do it. And he says, and I listened to the voice and I shot him. He says, and I've looked back on it a thousand times, and he says, there was no reason to shoot them. I said, Leo, do you really remember that night? I said, since you were on drugs, he says, chaplain, he says, I remember it like it was yesterday. He said, it is so vivid in my mind. He says, I can't ever get that out of my mind. I cannot imagine the pain and the loss that I have brought to that family. He says, I do not blame them for hating me. He says, I don't blame them for any feelings that they have toward me because I deserve to die. I'm okay. She was nervous coming over. She said, I don't know if I really want to see this. And I went, well, talk to Debbie. She'll take you to her. It's your choice, Robin, at any time prior to going over. Nah, I think I'm, I'm ready. Okay. Oh, oh listen to her. It's spiritual side, you know? It's like, oh, God, Shift. is this bad karma? Or, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? <laughs> Am I going to have to come back and do this and have people watch me because I'm watching him? <laughs> You know what I mean? No. But really, I feel like I had to do this today because this was just eating my heart up. I have a little place in that heart, and I think this will fill it up. Just to know that he get his part. Well, I hope it does for you what you feel you need from it. Belinda Kelly is going to walk out of this building where the news conference just ended and then she will walk across this way here. It is a walk that we've seen several times here in Texas over to the death chambers which will be in this building right behind me. When you turn to the next page, that basically tells you what happened to the inmate to the point of standing in cell watching TV, okay? How he spent his time before the execution. When you are in the execution chamber, please don't try to converse with the inmate. Know that there's individuals that are there watching the condemned. And the attorney Kurt Wentz, the attorney James Lineter are there for the inmate, okay? I went to see Leo. I got to the walls unit where the death chamber is from uh, three o'clock to four o'clock. The first thing I did was I went over his legal rights with him again and showed him the copy of the order to let him know that if he wanted to, to call it all off, that I could stop it. 
and he said, look, Jim, I want to visit with you. I, I uh, cherish this little time that we have. Let's don't waste it talking about calling off the execution. I've told you that what my, my uh, decision is and why I've made that decision, and that's not going to change. And he told me, he said, look, uh, I know if I die now, I'm going to go to heaven. And if I wait around another three, four, six, eight years based on my track record, I may not be in the same situation. So now's the time to go. When we get in there, he will already be lying on that gurney strapped down. The inmate will, he has the opportunity to make a last statement, okay? Mm -hmm. We don't control that last statement. I do not know what he'll say. Typically, there's a deep sigh, sometimes what you had heard, kind of like a little gurgling, okay? That's the best way to explain it. And then it's silent, okay? If anybody feels like they're gonna faint or be sick, just kind of tap me, okay? <laughs> We're there for you, okay? Does anybody have any questions about that? What happens if Robin gets to the door and changes her mind? Is that too late? Is there? I won't her? change my mind. I'm not gonna change my mind. Worst comes, worst case scenario, I'll just turn my head. Okay. I'm not gonna faint or anything. They will call for us probably about 15 minutes from now, okay? Have we checked the phone line, Barbara? We talked, and after we had cheeseburgers, he had a cheeseburger, and so I sat down and had a cheeseburger with him, and we kind of laughed about it. And so we sat and chatted for a while, and right at the end, about 10 minutes until 6, I looked at him and says, Leo, I says, we only have a few minutes. I says, is there anything you'd like to do? And he says, yes, I'd really like to pray. He said, would you pray with me? So I reached in and went, took his hand, and and um, he started weeping. And he says, Father, I know, I, I'm paraphrasing here, okay, but he says, Father, I know that I've sinned. He says, but now that I've come to the end of my life, he says, all I can do is to know that you have forgiven me, as I've asked you to forgive me. And he says, I pray that I can go out of here with a pure heart, and my intentions are pure. And he prayed, and then I prayed for him and his family. And it was a very meaningful time for both of us. And after the prayer, uh, that's about when the warden came in and said, it's time, Leo. The only reason that I witnessed his execution was because Leo asked me to. Leo told me that uh, that he didn't have anybody. He didn't have any real friends. He didn't have any family. He didn't have anybody, and he just didn't want to die alone. When I saw Leo strapped to the gurney, he looked like he had been crying is what it looked like. They said that it took about 15 minutes to get the IVs in, so I mean, he had to lay there for a long time while they were working on him, and you could tell it had taken its toll on him. It's always a difficult time because it's in a transition time, but I was standing there with my hand on his leg, letting him know that I was there, and we were talking, and <clears throat> he, he kept saying to himself, it's going to be okay. He says, God has forgiven me, and I have peace. And he says, my prayer now is that I can have a statement that is going to help. He made his last statement, and as best as I can remember it, he said, oh, I just want to say that I truly believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. That I'm truly sorry for the Kelly's hurt. I don't think that killing me is going to end that hurt. He then said that he didn't believe it was right that the state allowed the Kellys to come and view the execution. And then he said, let's do it. And he uh, leaned over and looked at me, just mouthed, I love you, brother. And then, uh, and he says, it's time. And I could tell when he said that, he must have been feeling the, the uh, poison going through his veins. And then it, uh, he went through, it seemed like an eternity of uh, violent shaking and, uh, and uh, heavy breathing uh, that you could tell, you know, was not something he was doing voluntarily. And as I would looked into his eyes as they began to become fixed and set and 
I says, well, Father, you know, your grace has set him free. Your blood has forgiven him. And now I pray that you will welcome him into your kingdom. Uh, and then he died. I mean, it was not an easy thing to watch. And it was not an easy death either. Is there any questions? <laughs> what was he like? <laughs> it was easy. <clears throat> I had more sadness going in, not knowing how I was going to feel about it. Like I said earlier before this happened, that it's, a, it's sad that it's a waste of a human, but it's not. I'm sorry. There were, it, this was not difficult at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it's done, and I'm glad it's over, and I'm glad he's off this earth. What was this like for you, Angeline? Well, I forget him. He'd done wrong, and that's all I can say, and I'll do the best I can. Do you feel better knowing now that... Oh, yes, I way? feel much better. Would you encourage other families to witness executions? Yes, well? yes. Why so? because I feel much better. It, it has cleared me. I don't have the weight that I felt when I went in there. And I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry for him. I know where Leo Jenkins is right now, and it's, and it's really low. And I feel good about that. You said it a bit too I tried to control it, but we can't. I really tried to think about Mrs. Kelly and her family. I cannot even comprehend the loss that they have had, and my heart truly goes out to them. And I do have a regret that they saw a different picture tonight than what I saw. It's sad that the whole nation is going to see an angry Leo Jenkins and not a repentant Leo Jenkins as I saw him. And tonight, I believe that Leo Jenkins has gone on to be with the Father. It's like they took the cancer out of me. It's hard for me to believe that I've gone through 20 years in this business and never really felt how real capital punishment is until last night. It's changed my views. I mean, I, I grew up uh, a very conservative Missouri Synod Lutheran. I mean, my family and I always believed that the death penalty was a proper punishment. But um, I certainly didn't feel good about anything last night. I could breathe again. It's an uncanny feeling I never thought I would feel. I mean, sometimes it's like I feel bad about it because it's like I feel too good. <laughs> I feel bad because I feel too good about it. I looked at that man. I just looked at his face when he was alive and when he was dead. And I thought, I'm, I am so glad. I am so glad you're gone. Texas is a little cleaner and safer now that you're gone. He was, he was just, he was using air. Some decent person could have been breathing. <laughs> I mean, he, it was such a release to me. I feel so, my whole family feels better. My husband, that for seven and a half years, I have watched this anger and this tense and strain on him. And this morning, this morning when he was drinking his coffee, it was almost like I got my husband back. I mean, the anger's, he's not here. And I do it all over again. I am so, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. I mean, I'm a loving, compassionate person, and I'll do anything for anybody, but it's like this, this, this was right. This was just, and it needed to be done.